So my name is Stephen Dudek. I am a attorney advisor and the education and coordinator outreach, the education outreach coordinator for the Office of Town Advocate. Today we're in self-representation uh, and we are having issues with the slideshow. <laughs> But I printed it out just to prepare, just because I know this could happen. So we'll still continue with the slides, and then we'll talk. I'll be honest with you, my wife is expecting our first child, uh, and so there are some complications, and I've got some text messages. So if I do have to take a phone call, I just want to let you know why, and I don't want to be unprofessional. So today is learning how to represent yourself in court. And it's the biggest thing because sometimes, one, attorneys are way too pricey. They're way too expensive. And also, sometimes you get the benefit of doubt just representing yourself. And we're going to talk today about landlord tenant court, small claims court, housing conditions calendar, as well as office of administrative hearings. And so the second slide from the title is phases of a case. And there's four stages. It's filing, preparation, hearings and trials, and post-trial, okay? And the biggest thing that I'm going to em emphasize today is preparation. Because preparation is where you win your case. It's where you prepare for the other side, and it's where you do all your homework. And if you feel confident when you do your preparation, it's going to correlate when you stand in front of the judge or an administrative law judge and present your case because it's all the facts, and you have to prove your case by using the facts, and your preparation is going to help you give the fact presentation. So as I mentioned on the next slide, the filing venues is, let's see, maybe a bit more. Okay. Filing venues, as I mentioned, there's four different venues that focus on tenant law. The main one everyone probably knows is landlord-tenant court. That's located at 510 4th Street, Northwest, and Building B. Landlord Tenant Court is known as Evictions Court. Okay? If you're there, you're usually being taken to the court by your landlord for non-payment of rent, violation of the lease, or any other way or mechanism that the landlord wants to get you out of the unit, he'll take you to Landlord Tenant Court. And this is part of DC Superior Court, is these types of courts. The next one is small claims court. Small claims court is the typical Judge Judy type of court. With that court, it only deals with money disputes. And you would be in there if your landlord withholds your security deposit and you want to get it back and you want to contest it. The other issues that you would be there is a breach of contract. Say, for example, the landlord hasn't fixed the running toilet and the toilet hasn't been fixed for six months. You're entitled to some rent abatement for the money that you paid back. And filing a complaint and breach of conscience in small court is the best way to do that. Small claims court has some lim limitations on their jurisdiction. You can only claim up to $10,000 in small claims court. And that's something to know. If you're above $10,000, you just have to file in civil superior court. And guys, if you have questions, raise your hands. Since it's a small group, we can just answer them and just continue. Um, and so, excuse me, Mr. Williams, yes. can you just see if they can fix the PowerPoint? So, thank you. Um, just trying to get the PowerPoint up here. Um, the next court is housing conditions calendar. If you have a housing code issue, that is the court that you want to file in. That court is known as fix-it court because its jurisdiction only focuses on addressing housing code issues. And so with that, you file it, you go through that process, and the process should end up with the landlord fixing it. If not, great, thank you. Here we go. We're good. So. Thank you, sir. So housing code, housing code, housing conditions calendar, yes, is known as, we're good. Fix it, court. Yes, sir. Yes, um, I'm in the housing condition calendar court. Can I also go to have the uh, 
the judge put the, uh, my, my rent fees in escrow, if the landlord's not fishing the property in a timely manner? Yes, so that is a great question. And so the court does have that, juris that authority to do so. We don't advise any tenant to withhold their rent. The reason being it's a slippery slope and it can run the risk of being evicted. Now what you can't do is claim any rent abatement for you in housing conditions calendar. So say in the hypothetical situation, I'm a tenant, I call my landlord, my ceiling is falling in, there's issues with my bathroom, there's no hot water. I call DCRA to inspect, they haven't inspected it. Next thing I'm gonna do is go down to housing conditions calendar, file the complaint. I have my initial hearing where I inform the judge of all my documentation, what has been transpiring, and what the landlord needs to do. Now what I can't say is, since it's been six months and I've been paying $1,000 rent, I want that $6,000 back. I would have to go to a different court, and that court would be small claims court. And that's the only thing, and the thing that I'm discouraged with the DC court system, is you have to go to different courts to get everything situated. You have to know, okay, HCC is housing code, but if I want my rent money back, I have to file a complaint in small claims court. And then the last thing, Office of Administrative Hearings, is just another headache because that's for rent control properties, which I'm just going to explain next. Yes, ma'am. Yep, and that's a great point. It's like, you know, like you said, to get your money back, you have to go to another court. That could take months. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, I'm going to hold the money. You, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I, I completely understand what you're saying. The issue with this is twofold. One, if you justifiably withheld your rent because of the housing code, the landlord is going to have the right to take you to the landlord-tenant court for non-payment of rent. So now you have an eviction potential eviction on your record. Of course you have the defenses is my unit is value of zero dollars because of all these housing code issues. And you may win the case and that's great. Even though you win that case, that eviction of non-payment of rent is still out there. And what I've seen is I've seen tenants who justifiably withheld their rent, won their landlord tenant case, and then when they go find another rental housing, they have difficulty. The reason being is those management companies will do a search and they'll go on the court docket and see, oh, your landlord took you to court for non-payment of rent and then they don't accept their, they deny that person's application. And so that's why we tell tenants, there's people in the legal community that disagree with us and say tenants should withhold their rent. But we don't for those two reasons. One, the risk of eviction, and the second is the potential of affecting your future rental housing. I have a question. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. What if you pay your rent down in landlord and tenant court? Because I think that happened to me. I paid my rent. I had an attorney, but I was an attorney and I hired her. So her was her death when you paid your rent. Mm -hmm. so I paid my rent each, rent each month in landlord and tenant court. Yep. So then if, if I won't have an eviction. You won't have an eviction, but the filing for non payment of rent will be on record. Because anytime you file something in court, it'll come up. And you can actually identify and acknowledge your case. If you Google DC Superior Courts cases online and you type your name, any dispute or court case that you've been in will come up and have all the depositions. And that's what the management companies are saying. So you may be evicted or taken to court for non-payment of rent and you pay the first day there, but since they filed something, it's still going to be on that record. Yes. So, so if that becomes a record, then is there another step that you take to clear that record? So unfortunately, there is no way to expunge and sale the record. It is a thing that the OTA is exploring, because that is the issue, is we have tenants who justifiably pay their rent, 
even before the case is being heard. But Ma'am, I, I don't know. Uh, and, and yeah, and that's the thing because what happens is there's mistakes that be, are being made or people just run away and pay and they pay even before they have the initial hearing and then it's still on their record and it's being affected for their future rental housing. Yeah, you didn't answer my question about escrow. Will the court in the housing condition calendar uh, set aside the rental fee, rental payments in the escrow account? Yes, I, I, I said so, yes, they can. Oh, okay. But only, only when they request it. The, they'll, if, I request it if, if you request it, they will either grant it or deny it. Oh. Okay? And usually it's very severe cases that they do it. Yes, ma'am. You have to have your rent and escrow, but you have to have an open case to do that, don't you? Yes. You have to have an open case. You, you should file your case, and then if the housing code issues are so horrific that the court deems your unit valueless, they'll tell you to pay an escrow. All right. Okay? Or they might tell you not to pay until you come back to your next hearing. Okay? Yep. Why we have all these people out there in the street now. Yep, and I, and, I, and I agree with you. And unfortunately, there's nothing on the books. But as again, it's OTA. Hopefully in the next fiscal year, we're going to work with the D.C. Council to get something in place to protect tenants like that. That's where the advocacy groups come in. That's where we as uh, residents come in to start protesting that. Exactly, ma'am. Yeah, so we can, we can talk more after about the situation. So... As we are aware, the three major superior, court, superior courts are Landlord-Tenant Court, Small Claims Court, and Housing Conditions Calendar. And the process all lines up the same, where there has to be a complaint filed. And with that complaint filed, there's different parties. So you have your plaintiffs and you have your defendants. When, you're, when a tenant is taken to landlord-tenant court, they're always the defendant. Because in that jurisdiction, that's when the landlord is saying, we're taking you to court because we want back of our unit. In small claims, housing code issue, housing conditions calendar, you are the plaintiff because you're initiating that action. And you're going down to the court and to file. And what I have, is I have just the handouts of what each jurisdiction is, if you can just pass it around. And so, and the last, the last jurisdiction that I forgot to mention is the Office of Administrative Hearings. Now, the Office of Administrative Hearings is a separate jurisdiction that focuses on whether you're on rent control <coughs> units. So if your unit is a rent controlled unit, you have the luxury of filing a tenant petition. Now, what is a rent-controlled unit? A rent-controlled unit, every unit in the district is subject to rent control. However, there are exclusions and exemptions. The exclusions is that elderly homes, foreign government owning it, any subsidy or public housing is automatically excluded. Now, the exemptions is the small landlord exemption, in any building built after 1975. So that's why all the rents are going up because any building newly created from 1975 to now isn't subject to rent control. And the small landlord exemption is if a landlord owns four units or less, they're automatically exempt from rent control and they can increase the rent. And so if you live in a rent control building, you can file to contest rent increases, reduction of services, you can file a tenant petition with DHCD and go through the Office of Administrative Hearings process. And I'll just pass that along as well. Question. Yeah. Can you do that if you have a housing choice voucher? No, because housing choice vouchers are automatically excluded from rent control. And housing choice vouchers has their own separate procedures, uh, which we will not be speaking about today. What's housing choice? Section 8. Okay. So, yes. 
housing choice. That's they changed the name. <laughs> so back to filing plaintiffs. If you are the plaintiff, you have the burden of proof. And the burden of proof in superior court is preponderance of the evidence. And so in mathematical sense, that's 51%. It's not like criminal court where it's beyond a reasonable doubt. It's preponderance of the evidence. It's a lesser standard, which means that you may have everything except the smoking gun and still have a good chance to win. And so that's something to know. Now, if you're being taken to court by the landlord, then the landlord has the burden of proof to prove uh, whether he should take back the unit or not. Any questions on regards of the two filing parties? In regards to filing, there's a couple of things that you guys should focus on. One, if you have a financial burden and still want to file a complaint in court, you can do so. And that's one thing I want you guys to know is you can't, you shouldn't, your financial burden should not deter you from filing in court. What you can do is you can file the complaint at the clerk's office. And when you file that complaint, you ask for the form. It's a Latin term. It's not probably the appropriate Latin term when I say it. It's in forma papyrus. Okay, and you ask for that form. You fill it out, and on that same day, you'll go in front of the judge. And the judge will just do a calculation, okay, and then he or she will decide whether you can continue uh, with your complaint or if you have to pay the fee. Because there are fees equivalent with your case. For example, for small claims court, the fee of filing a complaint depends on how much you're claiming. If you're claiming between zero and 5,000, it's only $5. Zero through 500 is only $5. 501 to 2500 is $10. And 2501 to 10000 is $45. Now, you can have the court costs be in the complaint as well. And we can, uh, if you have questions on actually filing a complaint, the OTA does have that service where you can come to our office and we can sit with you and fill out the complaint with you to make sure that you get court costs included. Because only the judge can make the decision whether the, the landlord or the defendant reimburses you. For housing conditions calendar, you also have the right to, um, to do the informal papyrus. I believe the filing fee is $80, which can become expensive for tenants. So you just want to make sure. In regards to filing, you also want to ask the judge what the next hearing date is. Because when you file your complaint, that is going to give you the date where you have to show up to court next. And that will be your initial hearing. And you can ask the judge, hey, can you just be aware this date works for me, this date is not, or the clerk's office. Sometimes they'll be able to work with you, other times they're not because it's contingent on their, their schedule. And so you, you do have the right to do that. If you are being taken to court, so if your landlord is taken to, taking you to court, the best thing to do is file an answer. And what an answer is, is a document stating that, yes, this happened, but the reason why this happened is because of et cetera. So for example, if the landlord took me to court for non-payment of rent, and I say, yes, I haven't paid my rent, but the reason is, is all these housing code issues. That is answering why I have not paid my rent, and it's basically my defenses. And with your answers, you want, it's allowing the court to know what your defenses are. If you have counterclaims, you want to file the answer and counterclaim together. And counterclaims can get tricky because they may open another case and you want to consolidate the cases. And what a counterclaim is, is basically saying, yes, the landlord has taken me to court, but I have my own suits that I want to file against him and I want these to be heard in this huge case so we don't have three different cases going on. And so you do have the right to file a counterclaim. What, what do you mean, man? Yes, 
So you, you just don't have a reason to the, their claim? No, just didn't want the answer no, not yet. So, so for example, I didn't pay my... Full on the answer. Yes. Um, I, I'm not understanding your question. How about I'll, I'll take her a question and then we can come back to you. I didn't know you could file an answer in landlord-tenant court. I thought you just had to show up. No, you can file an answer, and you have the right to do so. There is a landlord-tenant resource center on the second floor that has a printed out answer form that you can just check the box and file with the clerk's office. And you have to file that answer before your initial hearing date. So, Question. Yeah. Given those circumstances, can you file, if you want to go to small claims court, can your small claims claim be heard in the hearing? So if your landlord is taking you to landlord tenant court. You've got your reasons why you didn't pay your rent. Okay? Mm -hmm. And you, you, you're asking for a rent abatement, and the landlord is refusing to do that. Could you go to small claims court? You could. What I would say is don't. I would say just focus on the landlord tenant court. Because what the court has, the authority it has, is they'll say, oh, you your rent was $1,000, but because of the housing code issues, your rent is 250, or your rent is zero. And so you, the landlord, should pay the tenant back. So that can happen in L&T court. Usually in small, you don't want to go into different jurisdictions if you can make the claims all at one court, because that will mean you're going crazy yourself. And then also, we'll get into legal jargon and there's a thing called res judicata where you can't bring in different claims that you should have brought up in one case into a different case. So if you can, you want to raise all the defenses and counterclaims in one case in situations where the jurisdiction of the court doesn't allow you. So like the housing code, the housing condition, I hate this name because it should just be housing conditions court, but housing conditions calendar doesn't deal with rent abatements, and that's why you would have to file a separate action in small claims court. Small, that, that's the situation where you would. Yeah, yeah, but everything else you want, everything in just that case. Have we, are we good, or? <laughs> if, you, if you want. So in, in, in that situation, so say you've already paid your rent and he has no right to take you to court, right? Because if... Well, if said he's, he's taking me to court because he said I have not paid. But you have paid. But I have paid. Yep, so that would be a little bit different. That would be I'm filing a motion to dismiss. Because if you paid your rent... Yeah. So, if what, let's talk after class, just because. Will that still fall on the answer? You, you can still file an answer. It would be a little bit different because I would say you would have the right to end that case right when you show up. Because if you have all your receipts and say I don't owe him anything, this case should be dismissed. You can still file an answer to protect yourself, but I'd say we should file a motion to dismiss. If the landlord has an attorney, what I would recommend in those situations, call the attorney. If you have proof, yeah. If, if you're not represented, you have to contact his attorney. And if, if they filed a complaint against you. So because in landlord tenant court, you'll have that complaint served on you, and that will tell you initial hearing date. And on the bottom, we'll have, if they're represented by an attorney, the attorney's contact information. And in those type of situations where you're up to date on your rent and the landlord is trying to evict you for non-payment of rent, I would say reach out and say, listen, we don't need to go to court because I'm going to win the case. Here's all the proof. Come to our office and we, we can talk and be able to uh, help, help you out as well. Yes, ma'am. Um, the example you were giving previously about how to consolidate all your complaints and go to the right court and all that, how do you figure out all that out? Like, which court to go to, what to consolidate? How do you? Th that is a great question. And so, 
<laughs> come, come, come to our office. Yeah. The thing is you want to sort of categorize your complaints or what you want the outcome. If you want to hold the landlord responsible to fix something, it's housing conditions count. If you want money back, a rent abatement, that's $10,000 or less for return security deposit, free track, that small claims court. If you're being evicted, you're going to land one tenant court. And so that's, that's the three things. And then, of course, there's our friend OAH, and that's rent control. And I would say come to OTA, and we can do a cost analysis of which um, court you want to file on. So filing, as we are in this room, is to be patient. This court process is not a sprint. It's a marathon. Unfortunately, we wish we could file, have a hearing, and have it be closed all in one day. Unfortunately, it's not like that. I equate the court to being like the DMV, OK? You go and sit there, it's going to take a while. And then your case is going to come up. You're going to have your 10 minutes of fame if it's just the initial hearing, and then it's done. So be patient. Know the process. Ask the court, when is my next initial hearing and how it goes about, OK? For small claims court and housing conditions calendar, you're looking at your hearing to be held within three to four weeks when you file. And at those hearings, it's an initial hearing. And what will happen is the judge will give a speech what the court is. And then from there, you would probably attend mediation because we like to mediate. But ask them. Now, in cases of emergency, as you see in the slide, there's a way to quicken the process. But it has to be an emergency. And the way you can do that is file a temporary restraining order, a TRO for short. And what that does is say, hey, your honor, the landlord is doing an illegal act or something he needs to address immediately. And we need to address today. So the most common examples is that is a lack of hot water, a lack of electricity, a lack of no heat in the winter time. You would go to housing conditions calendar. You would file a complaint as well as a TRO. Um, you, have, you can't just file a TRO on, your, on itself. You have to file a complaint with a TRO. And that TRO, you'll be taken to the judge's chamber, and it's just you. The defense has, isn't there and you're just explaining what's going on, and the judge will issue a TRO. If a TRO is issued, you will come back two weeks later, and the defender or the landlord will be there. And in that case, the judge is going to see if they need to continue the TRO with a preliminary injunction, or they should just transfer everything over to the housing conditions calendar. Yes, just, just the beginning to get the TRO granted. Because in a sense, you're saying, here's the evidence of why I need a TRO be granted today. And then the court, if they believe you, will grant the TRO and send that order to the landlord saying, hey, you need to address this immediately. And then they'll say, come back in two weeks so we can have a status and say, OK, is everything fixed? If everything's fixed, great. If not, how are we going to resolve it? And they'll continue with the court process. Ma'am, did you have a question? No. OK. Any questions on being patient, which is the first key of this process? Simple key, but it's something that can be aggravating. Yes, ma'am. Just curious, how patient? Um, we're in a building that's, you know, that, that still has issues before the Office of Administrative Hearings going on, what, almost 20 years now? I mean, how yes. patient are you supposed to be? I, I they basically wait until you die or move. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, and we'll, we'll get this to later on in, um, in the slides, is there's a lot of emotion because things that prolong for that, your anger festates and you just want to be like, scream like, can we resolve it? What's the hold up? What you need to do when you go to court is you need to take the emotion out of it because if you hold the emotion in, your actions are going to be dictated by your emotion. And so, 20 years ago, we didn't start like that, but, you know. Yeah, and, and it's okay to be angry and frustrated. And I would say when you enter that courtroom, 
you, you need to let that go because sometimes people come in and they latch out at the judge and the judge is like, well, I'm not going to deal with this. Well, we didn't do that. Yes. And so I... And I, we're still waiting. Yes. No, it's when the judge sits on it for four years before they issue an order mm -hmm. and then you appeal it and then it goes to the Rental Housing Commission and they sit on it for 10, count it, 10 years before they issue a ruling, remanding it back to the Office of Administrative mm -hmm. Hearing, yeah. adds another five years, and it's like, I know! <laughs> yes. So, and then you're paying all this money into an escrow account while it's happening. Mm -hmm. What can you do? How is this being, how, what can you do? That. That is a good question, and uh, I think we should probably talk individually, just because I I don't know the aspects of your case, and well, we it, know it shouldn't. Anna and Joel, I mean, they they've seen yeah. us from day one, and I can honestly say in our case, and I think throughout the city, tenant petitions do not work. They don't allow discovery. So when you say preponderance of evidence, how do you get it when they don't allow discovery? Mm -hmm. The, the pro se tenants, tenants who go in without lawyers, are just yep. treated like garbage. They're not respected at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we're left trying to defend the Rental Housing Act, and I don't think that should be on the, the shoulders of tenants. Yes, yeah. Since it's already a law. The, the system has failed you. And it, it, it has failed you if you had an ongoing litigation for 19 years. It's still going on. And yeah, and no one stepped in like, you know, it's just like, and the rule is, it's supposed to, each thing is they have 120 days, and yeah. they haven't seen that, and it just keeps rolling along like this, and it's like, what are you guys doing about that? Yes. So, so in your case, I'd say patience is out the window, and you shouldn't. Well, I was patient. for the first fifteen years or so, <laughs> and it, yeah. it's it's happening all over the city, not just us. We're yeah. Just you know, an example of something that's widespread. And why isn't OTA camping down on this immediately? I mean, people are putting thousands of dollars a month into these protective orders. That's what they're called, escrow accounts, and. The, the landlords, especially if you have a wealthy one, they can wait till you die. And so is, is that what you say that you're putting it into an escrow account? Was there a landlord-tenant yeah. case as well? Oh, yeah. Okay. And it's just the same like 15 years ago. It starts that way. And, yes, you know, yes. And they can just outspend you and they can keep... So yes. even if you were wrong, you, you know, and your rent's... As big as much as they say, it keeps going and increasing. You can't get it resolved within a year or two. And so I take it the landlord has a big law firm that's just. Of course. Yes. Okay. So so there's a couple of things. One, we should talk, and so I can put some more fire in uh, to get an understanding because I'm appalled that it's taken that long. Uh, because either if you're right or wrong, you just want an answer. And, and that shouldn't be, it shouldn't take 19 years to do that. Yeah. And if you're of a certain age, like if you're 50 or over, you, you know, your yeah. chances about living your tenant petition get, or, yeah. and then so you have all of your retirement savings tied up in this case that you can't get to. And if your landlord's wealthy, all they have to do is just sit back. Mm -hmm. That's probably their game plan is just to wait you guys out. And so... Just, just a couple of things just for what they said. When you contest a rent increase, and remember only rent control properties do, what can happen is we usually we advise tenants to pay the rent that they're current paying and not the rent increase. Usually what the judge does, not the judge, the landlord does is file a eviction case against those people. There are protections in the court to tell the landlord tenant court, hey, don't evict me. I have this case pending in OAH stating contesting the rent increase. And so, unfortunately, OAH is dropping the ball on, on you ladies uh, because that should never have happened. And OAH is a timely procedure in the sense of just a gap between everything that is done and just the brief things that I've done. I've only done a couple of cases in OAH. Fortunately, I've been able to resolve them in mediation. Um, and so 
And also just with OAH, what happens is if you want to appeal the law administrative judge's decision, it goes up to the Rental Housing Commission. And then they will remand it back down. And then you could no, potentially sit on it for a couple of years. The, and at every day, there's supposed to be three of them, but they don't pay that much. So usually there are only two. And sometimes there's one, and they have to have a quorum to vote on stuff. So that'll add about five years to the process. Mm -hmm. And so in, in that sense, that's something that if you are going to file a tenant petition, use their example to think. <laughs> Because you may be able to do the same claim in small claims court, which would be a quicker process. So depending on what that claim is, if it's only a rent increase in a rent control property, unfortunately the tenant petition is the only avenue that you can contest a rent increase. In preparation, yes, preparing for trial. Gather your evidence. <coughs> preparation, 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 preparation. When I was in law school, I had one class, and that was built into me. Preparation times five. Make sure you're prepared. I'm a big sports fan. You can probably tell I'm from Massachusetts, and I, I, I love my Boston teams, okay? And there's always a quote. More games are won during practice than the game itself. And I take that to heart, and I use that when I represent the tenants. And, for example, putting on this tenant association, uh, tenant summit as well. If you prepare and you know what to say and you know your evidence and you have everything organized when you go in front of the judge, it makes your life a lot easier. And it also gives credence and credibility to you because you know, Your Honor, here's the document, here's the broken window, we're good to go. If you don't have that evidence, you don't prepare, you don't think what you're going to say, it's going to be difficult. People don't like public speaking, and especially when you're new to the process, myself is too. I remember my first couple of cases, I'm there holding the podium, shaking, trying to talk to the attorney uh, and the judge. But I was prepared so I could lean on my notes. And you can bring notes in. You can't submit your notes into evidence, but it can help dictate what you're going to present to the judge. Awesome. Say that again. Yeah, you can send pictures. And what I recommend is if you have pictures on your phones, because these are great and also bad in some reasons, but if you have all your pictures on your phone, go to Staples, go to Kiko's, print them out beforehand, okay? Yeah, print it out. Text messages, print that out. What you want to do in preparation, what I do is I put everything on a table and then I organize Okay, what can I use to say, hey, he's been notified of this issue, here's these text messages in a different folder. What can I use to show that I pay my rent, here's my bank statement in that folder. You want to gather all the evidence that you can do. My goal for the education outreach coordinator this year is to have different samples of all the documents that you need to be online and also in our office. To say if you want to do self-representation, you can come in, you can meet with one of our attorneys or myself, and you can say, here's a sample of what all the documents that you need, how you should have it organized, just to go off. Because I think sometimes that information isn't available and it can be very difficult on should I have this document versus that document. And also use that, use us to talk about that. Because we can make a list of all the things that you should need for your case. And it will be a little bit different based on the jurisdiction of your case. Any questions on preparation? How many times do we prepare? Five times. Okay. Also, use your imagination. The biggest thing is you got to prepare for what the other side is going to say. Okay. And you want to always think, how are they going to counter my evidence? If you can do that, it's going to be a show you already know when you show up to court. Because you know, OK, I didn't pay my rent because of the housing code issues. Here's the pictures. What is he going to say? Your Honor, I need my rent. I fixed these housing code issues, or I didn't. She still needs to pay my rent. You know that, and you can anticipate that by presenting. And you can say, Your Honor, I didn't pay my rent. And the landlord is going to say, I should. 
But the reason being is of these housing code issues. And the landlord's going to say that the value of the rent is $1,000, but Your Honor, by the way of the pitches, it's $0. And now you just took away his arguments. And all he's going to do is just repeat what you just said to the judge. And so that's why it's also best to know and prepare yourself for what the landlord or the landlord's attorney is going to say. And we can also assist you with that. What I also would recommend is each process gives you an opportunity for mediation. Always attend mediation. Even if you don't settle, and we'll have another slide on mediation, you want to do mediation for two reasons. One, it's the last opportunity where you have the choice and a say in your outcome. The second is you can do your homework and hear your landlord's arguments on why they're taking you to that court. And so attend mediation, hear what they're saying, and therefore when you go to the hearing where you present your evidence, you already know what they're going to say and what their case is. And you can better prepare yourself. Yes. Show up on time. Half the battle in life is just being there, right? That's what we heard in high school. If you just show up, you automatically get a C. If you do your work, you'll be able to get that A. Same thing with court. If you just show up, you're ahead of the game. You don't have to deal with defaults. You'll be able to hear the judge and participate. Be on time. When you come in at 9, check in with the clerk and go through roll call. Don't wander in the halls. This is where comes the DMV. You're going to be sitting there for a while. Bring a book. Bring something to pass the time. But show up on time and check in. Every court has their own check-in process. We usually will go to the courtroom, speak to the clerk, you will give your name, and they'll check you off. Make sure you show up on time. People who don't show up time or don't show up at all are a step behind because there's another layer that they have to deal with. They have to remove the default judgment. And usually if you are the defendant and you don't show up, the case is awarded to the plaintiff. If you're the plaintiff, if you're the one that initiated the action and you don't show up, the case is automatically dismissed. So make sure that you show up. Any questions? How are we doing? Is this informative? Maybe? Be pleasant. Courtroom decorum. Fill out the room. Okay? And this is where the emotion comes in. You're not going to like everyone who's on the other side. You're definitely not going to like them because they're ruining your day. You have to go to court. You have to stop your life to deal with this. Especially you guys probably feel that since you've been there for 19 years. But still, you need to cooperate. You need to listen to the judge. And don't piss off the judge. That's the number one thing to do, <laughs> is you don't want to piss off the judge. You can piss off the landlord and the landlord's attorney all you want, but don't piss off the judge. Because the judge is human too, OK? And the judge, yes, is required to abide by the law and do what is right by him and by the law, but hu humans get emotional and can make decisions as well. And so don't piss off the judge because if you need a little leeway and you have a judge angry at you, they're probably not willing to work with you. But also don't be like, hey, here's an apple. I'm going to be a kiss ass to the judge because don't do that as well. But be, be cooperative. Try to work. If the judge asks you to share the exhibits with the other side, please do that. And usually that happens in small claims court is you'll have your trials. And you'll be there and the judge will say, this trial's first, the other two trials, can you guys share your documents to speed up? Do that. Because when you come into the courtroom and say, Your Honor, we met, we shared all the documents, we agreed that all the documents are fine, the judges be like, okay, let's go, present your cases, and it moves the process quicker. And so try to cooperate to move the process quicker. As I mentioned, keep calm and mediate. So remember those two reasons why you should mediate. One, the last chance to resolve the issue by yourself and with your say. Two, you're gathering information. And remember, you don't have to agree to anything in mediation. You have the right to walk away. We do have a negotiation 101 class at 3 o'clock 
in this room, and I would recommend attending it if you want to learn negotiation skills and tips of the trade. Read the room. Pay attention to the audience. Pay attention to the judge. You're probably not going to be the first cases called, so you could tell what type of judge, the mood of the judge. And you can say, OK, the judge is very stern today. OK, the judge seems in good mood. Make sure, as you can see on the slide, don't alienate the judge. We've got so many calls at the office where they stand in front and they say, the judge dismissed my motion. And we ask them to explain, and they say, well, I cussed out the judge. <laughs> and it's just, really? yes, yes, really. And, and in the sense, I, I have a couple of clips. They may not work of Judge Judy to show what not to do. Because what people see on TV, translate it and think that's how court is, and do it in the courtroom. And you can't do that. Because the judge, the judge views them as the god of that room. And they are the higher being, and they're going to make sure that order is being followed. So if you cuss the judge out on a motion because you were, didn't show up on time, you're not in a good case to cuss out the judge. And so tenants will have their motion to the vault dismissed, and the judgment still stays in the plaintiff's favor. And these are true stories. We could write books if we wanted to. And I'm sure the courts could write books. But you still got to be pleasant. You still know that when you walk through that door, no matter what, your focus is just what is that task there. And be courteous and polite to the judge, and it goes a long way. It doesn't mean you have to be over-friendly, but respectable. And you should be respectable no matter what, no matter how angry or frustrated you are. Show and tell. Bring all your documents. Also, talk to the clerk's office Come to us if you have questions on how to issue exhibits. For example, small claims court is a little bit different. If you go to mediation and then you have trial, you just have to show up your pitches there. You'll probably meet with the opposing side to confirm that the pitches are authenticated and okay. And then what will happen is while you're talking, you would give the judge the picture. They'll put a little sticker on it and then they'll return it to you after the case is done. So you want to learn the process. Learn the lieutenant court is a little bit different because you have the right for discovery. And what discovery means is you have right to ask certain questions and get certain documents from each side. And so you want to know what is the process, and we can help you. Small claims, housing conditions calendar, uh, office administrative hearings, they don't have discovery or they have limited discovery. And so you want to know the rules of the court and online they have the rules of the court. And so that's something especially if you are missing information or you need information on the other side, their documents, you want to know if you can request discovery or not. And usually you can, it's very limited except for the office administrative hearings. Usually discovery is not admitted in that, which... No, it is not. Yes, which hinders the process as example A. And through that, remember when you get those documents, breathe. No matter what you do, when you go up in front of the judge, breathe. Relax, take your time. <laughs> A tip that I learned in public speaking, and what you can do is in the courtroom, is be silent. Act like you want to move the podium. And when you get comfortable, don't take like five to 10 minutes being silent, but take uh, 30 seconds just to compose yourself and stop. The judge isn't going to get angry. The judge will see it, and the judge will probably like it better because now your thoughts are collected. And this is why I say take your time, because you want to be, be clear and stay focused. You only have a short time with the judge. And if you ramble on and on and on and on and don't get to the crux of your case and your evidence, you may miss the opportunity to give that to the judge. And the judge isn't some wizard who will know that's what you want to say. And this is where the preparation comes in. If you prepare with your outline, with your notes, when to give the exhibits, when to give the evidence, then you will be able to be calm, be focused, 
do your speech, and you're good. What we hate is people who just ramble, ramble, ramble. Think about it. We hate people in the meetings today. Or if you think I'm rambling, 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 you're like, please just shut up and get to the point. It's almost lunchtime. We get that. So be focused. Be clear. You can do that through your preparation. And with the pro tip, I think the pro tip is excellent. If you have a long story, ask, so what? Get to the crux of the story. Usually you can get to a story within two to three sentences by giving the main information. So be a critic on yourself. Understand what you need and not need for your presentation to the court. So I do have a clip. Slow as it's looking as it is. Nope. Do we have it? Uh, like what? Give me what was stolen. My wallet. I like what? Give me what was stolen. My wallet. What I was in to, your wallet? It was 50 bucks. Okay. I had to replace all my IDs. I had gift cards in there, my earpiece, and a calculator. Better was no earpiece in the mail. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> 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 Judging for the plaintiff for the amount of $500. That's what I think it's worth, madam. Goodbye. You know this. The defendants jumped the gun. The defendants basically told the judge what was in the pocketbook, and that's why she quickly dismissed the case in favor of the plaintiff. Wait until you speak. Don't raise your hand. Don't do anything. Wait until the judge asks you to speak. I'm going to show you another video from our friends from Judge Judy. And I want you just to watch the lady, the pointer, who is talking. Watch her body language. This is what you should not do. Mm. And she's from Massachusetts, too. So. <laughs> <laughs> Judy. Shannon Jones says, former friend Brandon Bilby illegally repossessed a Honda Accord he helped her buy. Brandon is countersuing for unpaid parking tickets. Miss Jones, when you drive a car off the lot, it depreciates in value. You bought this car in January. He took the car back six months later, during which time you drove it. Your agreement with him was that, according to you and according to him, that you would make the payments on the car, which you did. And because he was liable on the car, because it was in his name, you would keep the insurance up. Because if the car was in an accident while it was uninsured, he'd be stuck on the loan. Yeah. And I, I, now I listen to you. I, now I don't want to hear you again. I'm telling you what he has to do, because he had every right since you breached the agreement on the insurance to take the car back. But he can't keep the car because that would be unfair. You put money into the car. So when I get nothing, I just lose it all because I was sick? Just listen to me. This is a court. You're not on Dr. Phil. You're not on Oprah. I need this to be is, on Dr. Phil. This is a, this I is need a court. Oprah too. I'm almost I, finished I with you. I'm almost finished with you. I'm almost finished. Okay. What he has to do, just as anybody or any company that repossesses a car on which there is an outstanding loan, company can't keep your property. Just like a bank can't keep your foreclosed house, they sell it. If they sell it for a profit, the bank can't keep the whole profit. It has to pay off the mortgage and it gives you. It doesn't usually happen. But he is not required to give you back the money that you put into the car because you, for whatever reason, illness, you let the insurance lapse, which gave him the right to take the car. So what he has to do is, and you could do it with him together, is just your name on the title? It is, it's just my name. Then you have to sell it, and if you get any money from it, after you've taken care of the tickets, you have to give her the money for it. Now, 
what was the total cost of the car? The surplus they wouldn't give us. What was the total the cost total of the car? The total cost of the car was $26,636.40. And this is a 2014 Honda? 2014. Bird, would you look up a 2014 Honda Accord? Is that what it is? Yes. So we'll give you some kind of an idea what you can sell it for. Put your hand down. I'm not listening. I'm done. Okay. I just asked you a question. No, I don't answer questions. Please. Well, I really want your advice. I just need you know, like, what you I'm not giving you my advice. I just told you what has to happen. No, I was wondering about my tickets on the BMW. Should uh, I just take them to the court for that then? Absolutely. Okay. Can my mom get an autograph? She, like, loves you. No. I tried. Mom, I tried. <laughs> Got it? Scan 19 here. Okay. So, the call was $26,000. That's what you yes. just told me. She put down nine, which leaves a $17,000 loan that you took out. Is that right? Yes. The car is now worth almost $20,000. 19843 I assume it's in good condition, correct? It is. it is. Great. Then what you have to do is you have to sell the car and get almost $20,000. She's entitled to $3,000 less the tickets, unless she sues you for the tickets that she paid for you. Did she pay tickets for you? No. What are you talking about? Are you kidding me? I'll prepare the order. Thank you. That's all. Are you designing up me at the car? No. Just lie. It's just sending you down the toilet. Lies are excused. You are dead. I really did start with the BMW because, well, no, he financed the car for me because I had bad credit whenever I messed it up. She lent out the BMW with numerous people. So I probably had it for a week. I let one other person use my car because I let people... Brandon used my car. People let people use cars. Like, don't react like you don't do that either. You haven't used someone else's car once. She called me and told me that she's going to drive this Honda until either she's arrested or it's repossessed. Brandon, I'm going to not be your friend. It doesn't pay to be nice. And no. She rules in favor of the defendant. But what you see, the body language, the head to the side, the attitude, the interruption. She raises her hand and tries to interrupt the judge. Don't interrupt the judge. Attorneys should never interrupt the judge. If we can't interrupt the judge, no one should be. And no one should. What the judge speak. She will give you the opportunity to speak and be heard. And just to let you know, Judge Judy is small claims court. And so people watch Judge Judy and try to imitate small claims court. And so that's something to be aware of, is that you may, the other person on the other side may act that way and don't. For example, when I first moved down here, I had a case in small claims court. I wasn't bad yet in DC, so I had to have one of my colleagues do it. One of my colleagues started to interrupt the judge, and I was just like, what are you doing? Just stop, just stop, just stop. And the judge was like, why are you interrupting me? He got cussed out a little bit, but then he learned. Some judges, as you may just dismiss the case, or may just say, I'm done, depending on where you are in the case. The judges do have the right to hold people in contempt if you're not abiding by the terms of the court, if you're not listening to the judge. That is very outlandish behavior, but people get to that point. Especially in the landlord tenant court, when you're being evicted, that's your whole life. And if you're being evicted, it's a very scary, scary process. Also in small claims court, people have outbursts. It's a frustrating thing to go to court. And it is. And what this course is hoping to do is just identify the 10 ways just to breathe, relax, prepare yourself. Because it is aggravating. It is, why is this process taking forever? Just why? There's a lot of why questions. But if you can prepare, and if you can identify what you need to prove in your case, you're ahead of the game. Because that preparation and your ability to stay calm and focus at the task at hand will hopefully pick the process up. Now there's situations where the court just runs around or depending on the defense attorney, is just waiting you out. But court should never be like that. Court, small claims, HCC, OEH, Wayne Lieutenant Court especially, they're all there to have a quick decision. Quick decision should be within five to six months, a year, depending on the jurisdiction, but 
it should be a quick decision. The next thing, post-trial. Get it in writing. If there is a settlement agreed upon and mediation, you'll have something in writing. Anything that is decided by the court, you will receive that in writing. Save that. Save your files. Save your hard work. Because you never know if you're going to be in the same position again, and therefore you'll have a reference point. But any agreement, any order, you should save and should be in writing. If you can't find it, you can always go back to the clerk's office and they can give you another copy at a fee, which is quarter or something to how many pages that you're asking for. Or you can always check it online because now they're uploading on the, all the documents in your case upline that you can have as well. Make sure you have something and save it. And so here's the list. The top 10 things, be patient, organize, use your imagination, show up on time, be pleasant, keep calm and mediate, read the room, show and tell, be clear and stay focused, and get things in writing. And so I do have on the handout and all the slides for you is if you are looking for documents, those links will bring you right to those documents. Is there any questions or concerns? We got like five minutes. So a nuisance could, no, you're, you're right. So that could be noise violations, things like that. Sometimes property managers identify tenants who try to hold them accountable as nuisance, um, anything like that. Usually what happens with the eviction process is if there's an action of the tenant that violates the terms of the lease, the landlord will issue a, that tenant a 30-day notice to correct or cure. In the, in the eyes of the law, no. The reason being is she has the right to notify the landlord what's going on. And that's probably why they shouldn't be able to do anything. Now, if they do anything to her, like increase their rent, try to evict her, then she would have the right to raise retaliation as a defense. And so if you go to Renters Rights 101 Part 2, it will talk about eviction and retaliation in that process as well. Any other questions or concerns? Okay, uh, so if you guys can just fill out your surveys and uh, when you're out, please hand them to uh, Mr. Williams. And if you have any individual questions, please come up and speak to me. Uh, and I hope you guys enjoy this presentation. Thank you guys.